If you're a commercial real estate principal, you may have pondered the performance of your business. You may be wondering, how much revenue should we be having split between property management and sales and leasing? What's a good amount of revenue to be generating per employee? How does the performance of my business stack up against my peers? We're going to give you some numbers that you can use to analyze how your business is going in today's episode. Hello, welcome to episode 185 of Commercial Real Estate Leadership. I'm your host, Darren Krukowiak. Really appreciate you joining me today, especially while the Olympics are on. We're here to help you grow your commercial real estate business. And another thing that we're here to do, as you'll learn in today's episode, in terms of what the purpose of CRE success is, is to make this industry a better place to work by making the industry have better leaders. And that was a question that Will Tong asked me. We've got the second half of the interview from the WTF podcast to share with you today. We're also going to be talking about the future of commercial real estate and the impact of technology. By the way, if you haven't grabbed our free GPT, which is kind of like an app that sits inside ChatGPT, the really good news is that these apps, these GPTs are now available to all users of ChatGPT. You don't have to be a premium paid subscriber to access GPTs created by people like myself. So go to cresuccess.co slash GPT. I've got the commercial real estate listings copywriter available for you. And you can start using that completely for free to start turning your property listings into, I guess, far more vibrant and exciting and at least refreshed property listings that you can use to market uh, on behalf of your clients, cresuccess.co slash GPT. Uh, let me now hand over the reins to Will Tong for the second half of my interview with him. I also want to touch on what would be some good key performance met metrics to measure someone's success from an individual level, so individual agent level, uh, and also for a business. Okay. For an individual, I think... I like to just like look at a pipeline and just sort of say, right, if I pour 100 leads in the pipeline, how many deals pop out the end, mm. right? So it can be around how many leads we're able to generate to pour into that pipeline, or it can be around, okay, we're constrained, we can only pour 100 leads into that pipeline, how many deals can we get out the other side? So mm. then we've got to look at our ability to turn a lead into an actual prospect and turn a prospect into a meeting and turn a meeting into a proposal and turn a proposal into a, you know, in your world, a mandate or in an agent's world, a listing. Mm -hmm. And then to turn that into a transaction. Mm. Um, so conversion rate is one. Conversion rates and leads. I think mm. they're, they're, they're the two things that we want to be measuring. Yeah. And then you can start to look at like deal size as well. So you might look at then the quality of the lead, the type of the lead, and that would be another way to, I guess, accelerate that production. If you are an agent, the third sort of level apart from lead generation and conversions is around leverage. So you know, can I, if you want to double your income next year, you don't want to be, make that about working twice as many hours, right? We've got mm. to try and be more productive. And that, become, that comes through, you know, whether it's the use of a VA, whether it's the processes that we have in place to create a more systemized way of doing things. And also it's about the platform that we're using. So using technology, AI, different software to just create more efficiencies in the way that we're doing things. Yeah. I want to come back to the technology side of things. Yeah. So, so what about for a business owner? So what, what would your clients come to you? Yeah. And, and what a question you would ask them to measure their performance. Lots of things. So I want to know about their revenue. I want to know about how it's growing year by year. I want to know the revenue per employee. Mm -hmm. And then I want to look inside the different departments and look at the productivity of the individuals in that department. So How do you measure productivity? Number of employees divided by revenue. Okay. I'm oh, sorry, revenue divided by number, number of employees. employees. Yep. Um, so, you know, like how productive are the people? How's that growing over a period of time? You know, it might look like the revenue is growing, but if we added two more people, then it, actually we're not becoming more productive, we're becoming less productive. Mm. Within property management, it's around, you know, how big are the portfolios that our property managers are, are managing. Uh, it's around the uh, average uh, property management fee that we are charging or generating per property that we have mm -hmm. under management. Mm -hmm. Same with sales and leasing as well. Like, what's our average deal size? Like, can we increase the average deal size beyond what's going on in the market, which actually shows that we are either reversing fee compression or that we're starting to move up the, ch the value chain in terms of the types of properties that we're working on. So 
They're probably the main ones that I'm trying to get in hand, that I can get a handle on. There's other things like, so looking at the, yeah, actually churn's an important one. Mm-hmm. So particularly within property management, right? So yeah. we can bring in, you know, two new clients a month, for example, but if we're burning through one a month, then that puts a ceiling on the, the, the rate at which we can grow. Mm-hmm. And I guess the other one from a people perspective, most of my clients aren't huge companies, so therefore they're not doing like, you know, 360 surveys and engagement surveys. So just looking at retention, staff turnover, I think is important as well. Yeah, so are you able to share specifics in terms of the revenue versus team member? So what what's, what's what number is average, what number is poor, what's, what number is good? Okay, yeah, I, I get asked that question a bit and I wanna preface my answer in saying that all businesses are different. Mm-hmm. So some businesses that have a higher proportion of property management, for example, than agency sales and leasing, they might have a slightly lower revenue per person, but they're also a lot more, I guess, sustainable because there's this huge recurring revenue that exists, Mm -hmm. right? Other businesses can be propped up by one or two really high performers. Often, or sometimes, that can be the owner of the business, right? So Mm -hmm. the whole business is just based on the owner's production. So with those caveats in place, I would say, you know, it's it's sort of around that 250 to 350,000 dollars per employee in terms of revenue so, uh, so you know, that's, the, if, that's the average yeah that, that is oh i would say that that is that's a that's a good sort of level to target for so if you're below 250 i think then you're sort of i think it's hard to make money yeah if you're generating less than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per employee mm-hmm. and if you're above three hundred and fifty thousand dollars then i would be looking and saying you must have you know a couple of really high performing agents in here because you're doing much better than most of the businesses i see mm. okay Gotcha. Is that, is that helpful? Yeah, very helpful. I don't yeah. do my own numbers and it's, figure it out. <laughs> it's different at different points of scale as well, right? Yes, so course, bigger yeah. businesses actually it probably starts to come down again because mm-hmm. they've just got a lot more platform and you know they can continue to add people, but they know through the system that they'll continue to make more money. And you know, it probably goes up and then it comes down a bit over a business sort of looking at different business sizes. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Depends on the market as well. So I'll, just one other caveat I'll say, uh, clients I've got in regional areas, it's, it's a little bit less because it is a regional area, but then, you know, they pay less for rent, they pay less for wages and stuff like that mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. So what, as an as a, as a, uh, agency business, not a buyer's agency business, but as an agency business, ideally, what percentage of revenue should come from property management? Look, all businesses are different, mm-hmm. but... I reckon it's great if you can get 40 to 50% of your revenue coming from property management, that's great. Now, I would caveat that by saying that if that's the case, but it could be because your agents are underperforming, right? (laughs) So if you've got a really solid agency team and you could also have a property management business, which is doing about 40% of your total revenue, then you've probably got a pretty sound business. But again, all businesses are different. Yeah. You know, I've got some clients that have properties, like a thousand properties within their property management portfolio. And look, that's a great business. And it's probably a little bit higher in terms of the amount of revenue it represents. And that's okay. Mm. I've got others that have got a much lower, uh, property management represents a lower share of their total revenue, but you know, it's a it's a kick-ass um, sales and leasing business, so I'm not going to say they've got a bad business. Yeah, no, fair enough. It, it's, it, I mean, it sounds like you know, 40% is sort of uh, the uh, the cost of running a business, really. So it pays for all your overheads and maybe just a little bit more. I, I guess the, the one thing I would say is that sometimes I come across, and I can think of a couple of um, businesses I've, I've worked with that have this, where property management almost seems too high as a proportion. And that, to me, feels like we're not farming the rent roll and we're not actually growing the transactions business to the extent that it could grow based on our ability to have grown the property management business. Because property management, I think it's harder to grow a property management business organically Mm. than it is to grow a sales and leasing business. So Mm. if you've actually managed to grow a property management business organically and you've gotten it to a point where it's actually 70% 70% of your total revenue, then let's start doing some transactions as well. And, and because that's the cream on top, right? Yeah. You've already got a business that has recurring revenue that will keep the lights on. And, you know, there's, there's other things to look at, Will, like what, ancillary revenue. So making sure that we're charging for things that sometimes uh, clients expect for free. And there, mm. there are a lot of ways to, I guess, um, improve that number as well. So, but again, yeah, like I said, every business is different. Yeah, yeah, no, no, fascinating. I'm curious about technology. I want to talk about technology. So, you know, you've been in real estate for quite some time and so have I. And I remember when I first started in real estate, we were still using fax machines. Email, email communication actually wasn't 
the norm. There was only a selective number of people who were actually communicating regularly via email. I remember having my, my Hotmail account. Yep. You know, the, the granddaddy of emails. And, and now we're, you know, fast forward now with social media, we've got AI, we've got all these different softwares and, and all those type of things. We've seen, what, we've seen the changes in the past, but I'm more interested in, in hearing your thoughts on what can we expect in the future, maybe the next five, sort of 10 years. I reckon that commercial real estate is a bit of an older fashioned industry. It's a little bit more traditional. So one thing to look at is, well, what are the guys in residential doing? And you could probably then see what we'll be doing in two or three years, right? <laughs> yeah. So like you look at something like residential guys on Instagram, yeah. right? They've been yeah. doing that for a few years and it's still a, like a bit of a, a novelty when you see a commercial guy on it, but yeah. probably more of them will be doing it. So uh, look, I, I think there's going to be more of that. There's going to be, I think, also as some of the more mature commercial real estate professionals leave the industry or retire, then that's also going to provide the need for us to become a little bit more savvy with technology because I think there is still this model around the old way of doing things because mm-hmm. there are still people in the industry who are doing things the old way. In, in Korea, actually, I used to talk about some of our high before behaviors and the only tools they had was a packet of cigarettes and a phone um, because, you know, that's all they needed to, yes. to sell a building. Yes. But, you know, the times are changing and, you know, some of the younger guys that are coming in, they're, they're finding ways, like, to use data to generate leads on a on, at scale to prospect in a more efficient way so like i'm not sure if in jail they used to call it disintermediation i remember right and that was this idea that um i can remember when people thought oh like uber is the tax what happened to the taxi industry is what could happen to the real estate industry and in that it will just be apps connecting people and it hasn't happened right mm. because um, mm. real estate agents and agencies have an important role to play and i don't think that's going to change but i think you know, the agents who will do better in the future are going to be the ones that know how to use that technology. And, you know, the ones maybe who have been relying solely on their relationships maybe will be left behind or not. They'll be challenged by people who are using data, who are using all of these ways to collect information and to interpret things to provide, I guess, more value to the client. Specifically, like I think about analysing leases analyzing deals I think we're probably not using the full power of artificial intelligence or maybe artificial intelligence isn't quite there yet Uh where it can actually just analyze the stuff and like do evaluation for example you know like when you Mm. look up on domain.com.au or realestate.com.au and it tells you this is what your house is worth like I don't think commercial is there yet in terms of like just but but, but all the data is there yeah Right. So it's just a matter of like someone creating the app and then doing that and then that can create valuation models and all this sort of stuff. So I think that's coming or will happen. Um, But I don't think that there's anything at this time for commercial real estate agents to really worry about. It's more opportunity. It's more about and particularly if you're a younger agent coming through, there's so many different ways that you can compete now as opposed to, you know, if you didn't have um, if you didn't work in an office where there was a high performer that you could learn from and you didn't have the right brand behind you, then it was very difficult to be successful, right? Mm. Whereas now I think you can use technology and, and, and data and um, you can create leverage through social media to mm. sort of make things happen that, that weren't able to be done before. Yeah. So on social media, like you said, there are very few commercial Real estate agents on social media, influencers, In, <laughs> influencers. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Re- Resi. Yeah, you see, you see a bunch. When's the Gavin Rubenstein of the commercial going to emerge? <laughs> that's, that's my question for you. <laughs> but, but why? Like, why? Why do you think that's the case? Why? Why are we dinosaurs? Beliefs, I guess. It yeah. comes back to what you believe, right? Yeah. That's the reason why people are the way they are. You know, I, I think like, and I used to believe this as well, but I think now I've got maybe a little bit of a broader perspective. But I think. In commercial, maybe we think we're a bit above that, right? Like, I'm not mm. going to dance like a pony in front of the, the video. Like, you know, do, do you know who I am? <laughs> like, <laughs> but I think already there are people in the industry who are showing that that is not only an effective way to do things, it's actually a smart way to do things. Yeah. And so I think that that change is coming. But I, I think it's because there's a bit of conservatism and a bit of sort of staidness in the industry where people haven't been willing to to do those things just because they maybe turn their nose up at it a bit yeah. or they you know they think well and sometimes i come across these people who they say i had, I had an email from somebody uh, recently where you know i send out marketing for my agent courses and he said oh look th- that is not of interest for me because i don't need to prospect but you know i'd be interested in any referrals that you have for any ask me something i said you don't prospect but you just prospected me for referrals 
right? <laughs> so, look, I think when other people get good at doing things the new way and the clients of existing and old-fashioned providers start talking to this new type of real estate agent mm. and start taking and getting their attention and maybe taking some of their business, then other people start to take attention about, okay, well, we need to start to change some things. We need to you know, create more leveraged ways of finding clients, delivering value and using that technology that exists. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. I think you know, change is the only constant. And as a, as a business owner or just being in any industry, if you're not willing to change with the times, you're going to left behind. 100%. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that, that's, that, that's interesting. I mean, on that note, I'm not going to name any specific names, but uh, you and I both know a few people in the commercial property space that's uh, pretty active on the social media front, and, and I think they are, they are getting a lot of net positives from it. So I think social media is a very powerful tool to use if, if you know how to use it correctly. And you've just made me think of something for the audience, like look at some of the guys in the United States. There's some great commercial real estate agents mm. in the United States who, are, who have been doing this for maybe two or three years and they do a fantastic job. So if you want a model of how to be a great commercial real estate influencer, mm. still with credibility and not, you know, dancing in TikTok videos, then there nothing is a... wrong with that. No, well, you know, there is nothing... <laughs> but. but I guess there's nothing wrong with that, you're right. If you, the pointing. If, if you want to do it in a credible, professional way that is consistent with your values, let's say, there is certainly a model that is out there in the States and there's different you know, people who are, who are already doing that with great success. So there's a model there for you to follow. Mm-hmm. I, I want to ask about AI specifically. I know you're um, a great user of AI and I'm, I'm, I'm very slow to, to adopt AI. What are one or two things, what are one or two AI applications or, or tools or tactics that someone can pick up today yep. and dramatic, uh, dramatically transform their performance? Well, I think it's chat GPT, right? So I know that might be the obvious answer, but often the obvious answer is the answer because it's the answer. Um, so like, think about it as the blank page problem, right? Mm-hmm. So if, uh, if you were maybe going to um, pitch to somebody who had a scenario that you didn't have any idea about. Let's say um, you were going to pitch to a, a 45-year-old woman who was recently widowed and had you know, two primary, sc- primary school-aged children, and you're thinking, well, how am I going to speak to this person in a way that resonates and understands them because I don't have that lived experience and I don't know anything about what she is experiencing now? Phew, chat GPT, hi, I'm going to meet with this person and we're going to talk about these things. Can you give me an idea about what she might be concerned about, what her aspirations might be, and maybe five questions that I could ask her that would show her that I am somebody who would become a reliable partner for her in the future? And it will give you the answer, Mm. right? So rather than racking your brain for, I mean, we could sit here and probably brainstorm for two hours about what that person might be concerned about and still not get there, chat GPT has the information, right? So rather than making life hard for yourself, make it easier by asking chat GPT for a little bit of help with those sorts of scenarios. So get over that blank page problem. That would be a specific way that I would recommend using it. Another way would just be to guess, so, so one, one that I use, which maybe for those of uh, your listeners who work um, in a corporate environment or work for a firm where they have a CV that's already been written for them that's sitting on a website, but then they don't have much going on on their LinkedIn, a simple one is just to ask LinkedIn, uh, sorry, ask ChatGPT to act as a LinkedIn profile writer mm. and to take your expertise and turn it into a, an about me section in your LinkedIn profile and make sure that it sounds and then give three words that describe how you are as a person and how you want to come across in terms of the tone and the character of that. And then doing sound effects for your audience, ChatGPT will will do that for you, right? Uh-huh. And, and I guess a third way that I'd recommend is like on LinkedIn as well, and, and you know, for posting, for repurposing on Instagram. So if you're doing stuff on LinkedIn, you think, yeah, it's going well, I want to try it on Instagram, but you don't know anything about Instagram, you can just say, hey, Hi, ChatGPT. You and am I Instagram social media marketing go-to expert, and I want your help with turning my LinkedIn content into Instagram content. Here's the first example. What do you recommend? And you know, it will give it to you. And if you're doing this for marketing campaigns, I've got an example I ran through with a few of my students recently where we said, I've just won a shopping center listing in a regional area, and we gave all these different things. And I said, create a 30-day Instagram campaign that focuses on the retailers, the community, and prospective tenants, and tell me what I should say in the posts, what the creative should be, 
and you know a bunch of other things and it creates the table and then it even gives you like the hashtags and everything so now i'm not saying it's perfect but it's 80 percent there mm-hmm. so that's the sort of thing that would take you a long time to do on yourself or you'd spend thousands of dollars to you know instruct a creative or content agency to do that for you linkedin uh chat gpt can do yeah. it really really fast yeah yeah that's that's brilliant that's brilliant i think i'm definitely not utilizing chat gpt as much as i should i've got a premium account but i think i log in once every Two weeks. So you've got a premium account. My tip is like create GPTs. You know how you can create your own GPT? Yes. Yes? Yes, yes. So yes. I've got a GPT that, for example, Will, this is giving away one of, my, one of my little secrets. What it does is it analyzes the transcripts of my meetings with coaching clients and analyzes what's happened based on what I've told it I want to know. So you know, tell me what... That's a specific scenario that I've created that then ChatGPT then knows what to do when I just put um, a transcript of that meeting in there. So, you know, you could do that for your sales calls, for example. Uh You know, you just just ask the GPT, you are an an, an analyst within my sales team. And once the sales call is over, I now want to know, I want to be able to hand over the brief to, you know, one of my analysts or associates or whatever, please prepare the brief for me. And ChatGPT can do that. And particularly if you've got a GPT that has all the background knowledge about your business because you've given it all of that specific information within that GPT. Yeah. Wow. So that potentially saves you hours of work. Yeah. 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 And again, it's not 100%, but and there's, there's more and more content out there about how to talk to ChatGPT. And like, yeah, you just Google it, right? And, and you'll find some. Uh, or, you know, speak to, speak to somebody who, who has experience in using it. Ask, ask your friends, are you using ChatGPT? Like, mm. what are you using it for? Oh, yeah. and, and I think you like, one of my friends told me that he was like, they were creating some I don't know, poems in Latin or like in oldie time English, but it was uh-huh. like that just Star give me give me the, um, the script for Star Wars scene, but write it in ye old English or you know stupid stuff like that. Or something. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, it'll do it, right? So whatever you want, it, it will do it. If you just you're just gonna be able to think of it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now I'll definitely need to spend more time using these these tools. I'm definitely not I'm probably one of those dinosaurs. I don't think so, Will. <laughs> don't think you're a dinosaur. We're in a podcast studio. True, true. Thank, thank you for saying that. <laughs> I, 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 want, I want to go back to something that we touched on just a little bit earlier, just about the roles of commercial property agents and agencies. So, and, and I think, you know, with technology evolving at the moment, with, you know, the emergence of AI, blockchain technology and, and all of that, it, it seems like the role, the traditional role of a, an agent is evolving. I, someone, someone sort of mentioned this to me a few weeks ago that very soon we'll be able to transact peer-to-peer, like real estate peer-to-peer without the use of an agent using blockchain technology and all that to be a trustless system. I, 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 pret- I, I kind of see that potentially happening, but maybe on a smaller scale transactions. I still see that, you know, real estate agents are still going to be used as trusted advisors on a deal. So my question to you is, do you think commercial real estate agents are going to continue the role of being a broker in a deal, or do you think they're going to evolve to become more consultants and advisors? Interesting. Oh, yeah. So there's a few different things that I'm th- thinking about in my mind. I'm not an expert in like you know blockchain and that sort of stuff. But um, a couple of things that I'm thinking of, one is that, like, I think there will be some change in sort of how agents operate. For example, you can see a lot of the bigger owners, they have a lot of in-house capability Mm -hmm. in like leasing, for Mm -hmm. example. So that means that there is, I think, more importance in the tenant rep function. So perhaps there'll be an increase um, in the number of agents who specialize in representing the buyers or representing the tenants as opposed to working on the landlord side. And certainly, uh, if you look at how the market works in the US, the way that agents are compensated, particularly on leasing deals, there's uh, much more weight given towards the financial compensation of a tenant side broker than there is to a to a landlord broker. Mm-hmm. So if, if, if land, the tenants still need that advice, but the landlords can just get their stuff out there through a listing broker. Um, I'm, even though I, I don't quite know the answer from a blockchain perspective, one thing that I think might happen is that we might see more specialization within agencies mm-hmm. in terms of the part of the transaction process that you cover. 
right? So if we think about like most businesses, you have a, a growth function, you've got a fulfillment function, and you've got some sort of an operational function, mm -hmm. right? Now the growth function in our business is, the, is, is getting listings. Mm -hmm. The fulfillment function is turning that listing into a transaction. But that function, the fulfillment function is also a sales and marketing kind of activity. So therefore in our business, the growth and the fulfillment function are performed by the same person, mm -hmm. which is the agent. Mm -hmm. But I have a bit of a theory, which is that we're likely to see a bit more specialization within who does what mm -hmm. within commercial real estate firms. And certainly if you look at in residential firms, you've got more of that kind of like, you know, pods and you've got more, I guess, you know, some people do the listing presentations, some people handle the buyers, you know, some, there are, there are different functions that people have. And it could be that if blockchain or something else comes in to provide some level of disruption from a technology basis into how transactions occur in agencies that perhaps we'll start to see, you know, some people call it swim lanes, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll be, people will be more focused and more specialized on a part of the process than they are now because most commercial real estate agents and going back to a question you asked before is what is it that stops people's success? It's doing all of the things, mm -hmm. right? It's not being willing to recognize that your time is worth probably you know, if you're making 200 grand a year, your time's worth $100 an hour. So therefore, if you can get someone else to do something for $20 an hour, then that's a very smart move for you to make because that allows you to reinvest your time to increase your um, average hourly rate. Mm. So I think that while it might be that there are certain parts of the transaction that blockchain or other changes in technology might make human beings maybe redundant, then you know, whether it is advising or whatever part of the process that can't do, I think is where the business will gravitate towards. Mm, yeah, interesting, interesting. I, I, I agree, I think, like you said, that the growth phase and fulfillment phase is typically done by the same agent. And I, I do see merit in potentially separating those, those functions and having separate specialties within those functions. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. We will, we'll yeah. come back in five years and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I want to talk about your, your coaching business a little bit more and you know, what, what, are your, what are your vision and long-term visions for your coaching business? I, you know, I wrote down my, my vision a little bit recently because I, I, I prescribe the creation of a vision with clients. Um, so, but I can't remember what I wrote down. Am I allowed to look? Am I yeah, allowed yeah, to you check? Yeah, you get your cheat, cheat notes. I, can get my, my, I can't remember what I wrote down as my vision. Yeah, you get, you but get I your cheat did notes. write it down. So let's see. I've got a, I have a back end 2004 vision. Let's see if I'm willing to share this. Um, okay. We have, we have a more leveraged group coaching delivery model, mm -hmm. right? So what that means is, is that I'm getting close to the point where I'm full. And I don't have the capacity to take on many more clients under the current model, which is one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. So I want to see if there are some clients who might be willing to move to a more leverage model. And actually, what I'm, I'm testing that at the moment, and I'm seeing that actually that the benefits for the client is really great because they get to work with other people who are going through the same problems as them. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I want to do. It's, and that allows me, I guess, you know, what is the point? Of that, well, it can produce better results for my clients and also it allows me to help more people, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. that's part of my vision. Okay, we will be known in the market as the go to provider of leadership and business coaching, training and speaking for commercial real estate agencies. Okay, right? So that's part of the vision. And I think, yeah, I don't just want to be like one of the only ones. I want to like people to think about it and for people to proactively seek me out for, for that. That's part of the vision. Yeah. And the third one is, oh, this is a funny one. Darren is spending three months a year on holidays. <laughs> so that, that is part of my vision I for my it. business. So, I love it. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so your visions, when they, be, when they come to fruition, yeah. what impact on the industry would it have? Oh, okay. Well, you know, and I don't want to be like, you know, sit here and bash the industry and say it needs to do this this better and, well, you can better and all of that. But we still have some pretty you know, average mediocre leaders in the industry. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's getting better. I think the industry's improved. Like uh, it's not just about now like employing, uh, sorry, elevating the person who's done the most deals into a leadership position because uh, bigger commercial real estate firms are more complex. They're not mm -hmm. just, you know, doing sales and leasing. There's a, they're, they're doing a lot more of this corporate work mm -hmm. so therefore it needs a different type of person to be in that position so i think that that is a change and also there's more of a focus on 
you know, diversity, equity and inclusion and, and more of a focus on also more efficient ways of doing things and not just, you know, the person who works the longest hours wins. Mm. So I guess, you know, what is it that I want to, what, what change would I like to have on the industry? Well, I'd like the industry to have better leaders. I'd like people who have chosen to become a business owner to have a model of leadership that maybe they didn't learn on their way up through the ranks working at bigger firms, but that I can help them to one, be true to who they are, so to be uh, genuine and authentic in the way that they lead, but also to be effective and, and successful in terms of the results that they create. Mm-hmm. Probably that's the main sort of benefit that I would like to provide to the industry is mm-hmm. elevating the leadership and making it a, a better place for everyone to work because there are better leaders in that industry. And mm-hmm. that is, I think, an aspiration of a lot of, um, you know, the people who want to work with me, I, it's not always will make me a better leader. It's, it's, it's usually a, the, the need comes from my business isn't growing fast mm, enough. I've had mm, turnover mm, of people. I can't find the right mm, people. You know, pluck the holes, pluck the holes. I'm, yeah. yeah, like I'm burnt out or whatever, right? Yeah. But I think it's all, it all comes down to leadership and you know, that's, sometimes it's around delegating. It's mm. around creating a, the, the right the vision as well. So having other people buy into that vision. Mm. So yeah, I think if I can boil down your question, like what is it that I want to do? I want to make this industry a better place to work because there are better leaders within it. Yeah, that's great. I love it. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you about leadership bodies within the industry. So you know, if you look at all the different types of industries around the world, there's always a, a leadership body that uh, they don't, not necessarily govern, but provides certain standards and assist with the industry's performance and improvements and things like that. If I look at Australia, I look at the commercial real estate industry, I can't think of a leadership body that really services the industry well. I mean, obviously, you've got the Property Council of Australia. They do a decent job at it. You've got REI, but they're really resi focused. You've got, you've got fair trading, you know, but they're not really industry body leaders they just get you know governance the valuers have api exactly so i i personally think there's a there's a there's a gap there mm. but the industry seems to be performing okay without a you know a, 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 a substantial you know leadership body but what are your views like how important do you think it is for us in this industry to have one or do we have or have i, or I completely missed the boat i don't think we do have one but so, you know, I, I think well, I sort of had a smile there when you said, you know, the industry's performing okay without it. So, like, you just sort of pinpoint on the fact that leadership is important, right? Yes. But, so, and I'm just, I'm, what I'd be interested in knowing is, are there equivalent bodies within other industries, right? So, you know, uh, do accountants have a, a leadership or, or is it that there's a leadership function or uh, a leadership focus within the professional organisation or the body that serves those industries? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I can't speak on behalf of other industries, but you hear about the law societies and things like that, right? Mm. And uh, I'm sure the the, the, uh, the CPA had their own society, CPA uh, society, whatever it's called, I can't remember what it's called. Um, I, I think many industries would have it. I mean, a lot of labour unions would, would have it for certain, for certain industries, but... But if I look at the Australian commercial real estate industry, I, I can't, nothing really comes to mind. Well, the thing that's coming, yeah, the, the, I, I can't think of one right now, although there would be you know, leadership organisations that maybe have some representation of uh, commercial real estate business owners, principals, mm. directors within them. But I reckon one of the challenges with one body for leadership is that different there are different people who resonate with different styles of leadership and so forth right that's why you know i can't be that for everyone because some people just don't like me right because you know that that's you can't please everyone right so i think maybe the market is the right place for this to be sorted out and some people maybe will come to to me for that and some people perhaps will go to others when there are other businesses that provide that for you know specifically for commercial real estate businesses and you know i'm not I think there would be other leadership coaches and other real estate coaches that would have some representation of people from commercial who are commercial real estate leaders or business owners. So I think, I think it's it's there, it's provided, but I don't think there's one sort of anointed business mm. b- uh, body that's mm. sort of like a peak organisation, mm. if you like. So yeah. maybe the market sort of just sorts it out, and and some people go in certain places when and where they need it. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Well, okay. Well, I just in. Just mindful of, of, of time and, and, and really appreciate you coming onto this podcast. But are there any th- things that you'd like to share that maybe you never shared publicly? 
<sighs> or people should know about you, know about Darren? Not really. I mean, like, <laughs> you know, like, I, I have spoken publicly about the fact that I don't drink anymore and um, explained uh, the reasons why. So um, that's all there and documented. It's mm-hmm. been four and a half years since I've had a drink. And, you know, I think in our industries, and, and I don't really talk about that much because I don't want to be the guy who gave up drinking because he used to get too drunk. But I think that whenever I do share that and like when it's an anniversary, I might post something on LinkedIn, there's always like a, a, a bigger response than anything else I talk about, mm-hmm. right? And I think that's partly, there's a couple of lessons. That one, if you're going to sh- you know, talk on social media, talk about things that are real and that are important mm-hmm. to you because that is often what resonates and cuts through. But also if there's something that, you know, you've made a change or improvement in your life that you can share with others, then it's kind of like your responsibility to talk about that occasionally, mm. just because there might be other people who need to hear that message. But also in our industry, there are a lot of people who, you know, however you want to call it, party too hard, burn the candle at both ends, are hedonists. Probably I was a hedonist, <laughs> right? And, you know, just don't know where to stop. And, you know, this requires some self-reflection and some introspection and, you know, that, that would be, uh, if that's something that is relevant for you, I'd encourage you just to, to take a moment and to reflect on that. Yeah. No, that, that's amazing. Well, Darren, where can people find you? Um, so I would say that uh, the best places are LinkedIn. So find me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can uh, Google CRE success or just find me on LinkedIn, Darren Krakowiak. It's hard to spell, but check the Krak- show notes. Krakowiak. <laughs> oh, we, we practiced it before and he has nailed it every time, which I'm so impressed about. <laughs> so yeah, what I want you to do is DM me the word will, right? If you DM me the word will, that will tell me that you listened to this podcast and then I'll really sort you out. So you can do that on LinkedIn or you can DM me on Instagram. I'm at CRE success. Again, DM me will, right? That's the code word. Yeah. And then I will take care of you.